Good morning, once again. My name is Jason, and I'm the worship and discipleship minister here. Dave, our normal preacher and our senior pastor, is out of town on vacation. Actually, I don't think he's out of town, but he's on vacation um, this week, so he'll be back next week, but I'm filling in. And we've been in the, the book of Colossians for, um, for the last several weeks. So that's where we are today. We'll be in Colossians 4. Uh, if you want to get ready for that. Well, I'm gonna, we're going to do a little bit of Bible Olympics. Uh, at least I am here. That's what we called it at my old church growing up. Flipping back between a lot of passages and stuff. But we're but Colossians 4 is like our home. Um, my oldest son, Levi, is 8. So he just finished second grade. He's in Slainsville Elementary. And one day, he, well, before I get the story, he loves chewing gum. He loves it. We get a pack of chewing gum. If we're at the store and he asks about it, I'll let him pick out a pack, you know, his own pack. So he reads them. He knows the flavors. He knows about, you know, the chewing gum there. And if we get a pack of chewing gum, it doesn't last two days in our house. It's, you know, chew. And the other kids like it just because he does, I think. But he loves it. One day I was picking him up from school several weeks ago, and he had one of those cheap ones, the double bubble thing that he got as like a, um, a prize or a giveaway or something at school that day. And he's chewing in, and he's in the back seat, you know, we start driving away, and after a minute, I just hear his little eight-year-old voice going, this is definitely not long-lasting flavor. <laughs> right? Oh, I don't know where my water is, but that's all right, I'll be fine. Um, we know that, right? We experience that. So if you had a choice between those two, you're going to grab a piece of gum, and you got those two options on the screen there. That's the extras. He has this long-lasting flavor right on it. Which one are you going to grab? Okay, you know which one you're going to grab and why, because you know the flavor for that cheap thing is not going to last. The gumball or one of those little bubbles is not going to last. And then what use is the gum after the flavor is gone, right? I'm just going to spit it out. Um, one of my kids' favorite, thank you, one of my kids' favorite uh, nighttime stories, or one of their favorite books, and one of my and my wife's favorite books too, by the way, is called Owl at Home. And we have a picture of Owl, I think, up there, and the character from the book. Oh, with no background, that's great. So I could come over here and be on the screen with Owl. Oh, okay, he fixed it. Uh, okay, uh, anyway, um, it's a silly book, and the guy who wrote it wrote the Frog and Toad books, if you've ever seen uh, those uh, children's books. But this book is all about Owl at home, and what he's doing in this story is making tear water tea. And uh, so he sits in the story, he says, he's like, I'm going to have some tear water tea. So he grabs his teapot and uh, sits and thinks about things that are sad. And his tears start coming down and they fill the teapot and then he makes tea with it. Um, but the list of things that he says are sad to make him start crying, I think is interesting. Because uh, I noticed one day, they all have something in common. I'm not going to remember all of them, but uh, a chair with two broken legs that no one can sit in. A song that no one can sing because the words have been forgotten. A beautiful morning that nobody saw because everybody was asleep. You know, uh, a pencil that's too short to use. A uh, spoon that has fallen behind the stove and uh, never has been found. A clock that is broken and no one is nearby to wind it. And so it's kind of silly, but you know, that's, those are the things that he's thinking of as tears start coming down his face. And then he pops up and makes tea with it, and he's like, okay, yeah, tear water tea is a little salty, but it's always very good. That's what he says. But all those things that he thinks of that are sad to make him cry are things that have supposed to have a purpose that are not fulfilling their purpose. They're useless. The pencil that's too short to use. The, um, I think there was one that was mashed potatoes, cold mashed potatoes sitting on a plate that no one has eaten. You know, it's these things that are useless, and to him that's sad, and to the little kids, they kind of intuitively know um, that's, you know, that's sad, it's kind of silly, but it's sad. They're not fulfilling their purpose. All those things have a specific purpose, and they're not being fulfilled. Um, we are supposed to be useful or flavorful to the Lord, just like tear water tea, I guess. We're supposed to be a little salty. Salt comes up several times in the Bible uh, as a metaphor for that, and it does in this passage um, today from Colossians. We're supposed to be fulfilling a specific purpose. And that purpose is to show God to other people, to outsiders. Um, so go ahead and stand up, look at the people around you, and you can greet, say good morning to someone around you and say, you look very salty this morning.
right, so we have a purpose that we're supposed to be fulfilling. I want to read again the, uh, these five little verses that are our theme verses for, uh, for today. From Colossians chapter 4, it's verses 2 through 6. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Oh, that's too small on the screen, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's our purpose. Um, to show God to other people, as Paul writes the word outsiders here, um, in verse 6. I pull out a few other verses, Matthew 5.13, where Jesus uses that metaphor of salt. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt, has loses, its, its salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is then good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Jeremiah 13.11 is an interesting one. Jeremiah 13. Um, God tells Jeremiah to go and purchase a new loincloth. At least in the English Standard Version, it says a loincloth. In other versions, it says a sash or a belt. Uh, but I like loincloth. It's a little more memorable, I think. So in the, in the ESV, he says, purchase a new loincloth. And then he says, okay, and he wears it. And he says, go and bury this loincloth by the Euphrates River. So he goes and buries it. And then God says, after many days, it said, God tells him to go dig it up and find it. And the, the loincloth is ruined. It's like, it's spoiled. It's good for nothing. And in verse 11 of Jeremiah 13, God then tells Jeremiah, For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory. But they would not listen. That's the purpose of God's people, to be for him a name, a praise. To Who would we be a name, a praise to? To outsiders. Deuteronomy 4.6, Moses talks about this, uh, this kind of purpose uh, as well. Keep them, keep the, the commandments that he's talking about. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. That's why God chose the people of Israel. He wanted a people for himself um, to show him to the rest of the world. Because we know, I think we know, God loves everybody. He loves the whole world. And the purpose of his people, we are now, the, we are now Israel. We are now the spiritual Israel, the churches. That is our purpose, to show God to the outside world. So, back to Colossians. Colossians uh, 4, 2, the first verse of our, um, of our passage today. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. When I read that, I think, am I continuing steadfastly in prayer? Do I pray with thanksgiving often? Or in other words, could I say that this Bible verse written by St. Paul describes my prayer life accurately? And if not, I have a problem that I need to address now. Uh, this is a theme throughout lots of scripture. Prayer is way more important than I ever realized growing up. Um, I'll skip down to verse 12 of Colossians 4, because he gives a list of people who are greeting, you know, new people at uh, Colossians and that kind of thing, which sometimes we skip over. But in verse 12, I thought there was something very interesting. He mentions uh, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. I'm going to come back to that verse a little bit later, especially the will of God part. But he has a Epaphras here, this character struggling on your behalf in his prayers. I think, how often do I struggle in prayer for something? How often could, that be, could I be described that way, the way I pray? Struggling in prayer for something. We don't like to struggle. We like to coast so I'm thinking, do I care enough about some issue or some person or some group of people to do that? And do I go to my Heavenly Father like a child goes immediately to their parents for something? Um, they have three little boys, and so I think about this um, sometimes quite a bit, the way they come immediately. When something hurts 
or something goes wrong or something's not fair that they see to them, usually to them because kids are pretty selfish. We're all naturally that way. So, um, But or they're hungry or thirsty, what do I do immediately? Mom, mom, dad, dad. Because as far as the kid's concerned, dad and mom have an endless supply of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, right? So when they're hungry, they go, to, they go to dad, they go to mom, expecting that the dad or mom is going to make it right. And when they're with dad or mom, they're safe. And um, mom always makes it better. You know, it's funny. They, um, some of our, at least two of them probably, I guess in most of the time, at least when we're playing or when things are good, they kind of like dad better. But when they're sick or get hurt, it's mom, right? But they go, so we are supposed to be like little children, going to our father like that. Trusting, expecting, feeling safe, like expecting, father, like this isn't right. We're, like, do something, do something about it. Bring your will down here to earth. Because we know God is merciful and loving. We want to ask him to bring that down, bring that mercy and that love down to earth, make his, your uh, will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? That's how I feel like we ought to be praying. So what does Paul ask them to pray for about him uh, in verse 3 and 4? At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. On account of which I am in prison. I'm in prison and pray for me to have an opportunity to preach the mystery of Christ, he calls it here, the gospel. He doesn't pray for deliverance, for food, for safety, for anything like that. Pray that God may open to us a door for the word. And then in verse 4, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. The priorities of St. Paul and a lot of us is completely different. Um, now, that's not what all of us are called to do, that kind of evangelism and preaching. We're not all called to that you know, specific mission. But Paul gives us encouragement toward a certain degree of evangelism in the next couple of verses. I'm going to read them again, verses 5 and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So to me, verses 5 and 6 boil down to this. We have a responsibility to represent the Lord well. Remember those other verses? That's what he wanted his people to do, to be a name, a praise, a glory for him. So making the best use of the time, he says. We don't have much time on this earth, 80, 90, 100 years, 120 years maximum, some people less than 80. I was born here at this time and in this part of the world, so my responsibility is to find out what the Lord's will is for me here and now and embrace it. I think that's the next thing I have here, embrace it. There's a, um, there's a concept in the Tao, which is the Buddhist, like, scriptures basically about which i think a lot of the stuff in there is very wise and they've hit on a lot of truth and i don't know if god has revealed it to them or just from thousands of years of history they've gotten some wisdom from experience um and a lot of that if you read a lot of that stuff is very very similar to what we have given to us in the bible one of their concepts is um to like the realized person they call it so someone who's spiritual someone who is uh attaining the goal that they're supposed to attain. Anyway, they find their place, they find their place in the flow of time and the flow of the universe, and they embrace it. They accept their place. And they don't fight against it and try to do something different. Which sounds a lot to me like finding the will of God for your life, where he's put, where and when he's put you, and embrace it and don't fight against it. So whatever situation I'm in, uh, whatever job I'm doing, whatever people I'm around, embrace that role that God has put me in. Um, the cheesy little phrase, uh, bloom where you're planted, right? Have you heard that? Um, I worked at a place one time that had a, that in like the bathroom. And uh, a little, like a little uh, flower pot or something like, bloom where you were planted. I was like, oh, that's pretty, I, I remembered it, right? Um, so that's a, that's a, um, that's a key to us. I think a lot of times we fight against where, um, what God has given us, the opportunities, making the best use of the time. Let your grace, uh, let your uh, speech be with grace and seasoned with salt. You are you come in contact with people, and that's not 
your choice a lot of times. That's God's choice for you. Embrace the role that you are in. If I'm not a gifted evangelist, I still have a duty to the Lord to, at the very least, I think, represent Him and His church well to outsiders. Um, so I have a few ways I'm going to recommend you today um, to do that. Represent the Lord well. First, um, I want to talk about what I think is a prerequisite to this, to, uh, to going before outsiders or um, at least intentionally going to outsiders and, and um, attempting to influence them. You need to go deep in your relationship with the Lord first. To me, that's a prerequisite. You can't lead somebody else to a place that you've never been. Um, and I'm talking to myself here, especially the past me um, from years ago, because I was uh, grew up in church, and I'd be going to church, and I'd be going to small group, and I'd be playing guitar on the stage of my old church and stuff. Um, but I was not <clears throat> taking it seriously. I was not. I did not have an actual heart relationship with the Lord for a long time. Um, so I know, and I haven't always worked at a church either. I worked at public school. Um, so I know how difficult it is to, to do this. When I'm, and there's two, I hate cliches, but there's two cliche answers to how to do this. If you're not, if you feel like you need to go deeper, if you feel like you're not, if you're in the, if maybe I'm speaking to you right now, if you're in one of those places where you're like, ah, I'm not really there. I'm not gonna feel like I have that connection, that heart relationship with the Lord. Um, there's two cliche answers though that I think are right on, and that's pray and read your Bible. And I've heard that my whole life. Pray and read your Bible. Do those two things. Pray and read your Bible. Um, but praying in this way, not the way I used to pray when I was a kid and then growing up. Again, I'm not like Paul. I'm not praying for safety. I'm not praying for comfort. Let us have safe travels. Why? What if that's not God's will for your trip? You know, honestly. So I'm praying to align myself to God's will. Prayer to me is an exercise to change me, not to change God. Although there are some examples in Scripture of God changing His mind or relenting based on someone's prayer. But that should not be my, that's not the primary purpose of prayer. That's, not, that's more of an exception than the rule when, it, when the Bible talks about prayer. I'm going to pray like in the Lord's Prayer. Um, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I'm finding out what God's will is. God, bring your will down here to earth. Um, yeah, prayer is an exercise to change me, primarily. Elijah uh, in, uh, is written about in James 5, 17 and 18. And this is a really interesting story about prayer. So what James writes about Elijah in verses 17 and 18 of James 5 is Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. But if you look at the story, it's in 1 Kings 18, the very first verse of 1 Kings 18, when there's been a three and a half year drought. And in verse one, God speaks to Elijah and says, Go find the king, Ahab, because I'm about to send rain on the earth. He told him, I'm about to send rain on the earth. And then later on, Elijah, we find Elijah fervently praying for rain. He already knew that that was God's will. That is what God wanted to do because he listened to God's word because God spoke to him and he was willing to listen. So when he's praying for rain, he already knows that that's God's will. God, you said you're going to send rain on the earth. There's another example uh, from the Old Testament. In G uh, Daniel chapter 9, it says, Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah's prophecy, found that the time for the exile had been exiled away from the Holy Land into uh, Babylon. And at that time, I think he's already in Persia. Um, so anyway, he found that in the book, in God's word, in the book of Jeremiah's prophecy, he found the time of the exile is supposed to be over. God, you said 70 years. You said 70 years. It's been 70 years. So Daniel prays to God, Based on God's word, the word comes down from God, and then we pray it back up. That's how prayer is supposed to work. It's not just what I want. It's not whatever I want. It's what I know God wants for me, or for his people, or for the world. Something that I know about God's will is the most effective prayer. It's the prayer that makes the most sense. Um, and he prayed, and he, it says he humbled himself. He was in sackcloth and ashes, so that's like what they did to just humble themselves. 
and he was fasting. I think he was fasting. I know he was fasting in chapter 10. I don't know if he was fasting in that one. But anyway, read it, Daniel chapter 9. And he um, confessed. He, pray, he prayed with confession. God, we've been terrible. We haven't listened to you. We haven't listened to you. We've followed other gods. We've done all this stuff, and so all this disaster has come upon me. So even though he knew that was God's will, even then, he didn't say, God, remember you said... And I hate it when our kids say that. Remember, Dad, you said we were gonna go to the pool, or you said we were gonna, you know, do this. I'm like, oh yeah, you know. I don't know if God reacts like that. <laughs> oh yeah, God, but probably not. But, but even then, even though he knew, he said, God, you said this, so bring it about now. He's praying for that, uh, but still with humility and confessing, you know, confession. Uh, that's a big part of it. So that's how we should pray. And I already mentioned the Lord's Prayer: Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, did you notice that Epaphras' prayer in verse 12 that we read a minute ago for the Colossians? Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. It's about the will of God. That's what prayer is about to me, I think, in my opinion. Primarily, finding the will of God and embracing that so I can embrace that. Um, okay, so I think the other part of that, pray and read your Bible. So I mentioned... Uh, prayer is like the word comes down from God to us and then we pray it back to him. Well, the word is mostly, primarily, right here. And so we have to know what it is in order to pray it back to God. Makes sense? So, but when I'm talking about reading the Bible, I'm not just talking about reading it. I'm going to read a few verses for five minutes before I fall asleep in my bed at night. I'm talking about taking the Bible seriously. In Psalm 1, I'm pretty sure I marked it here so I can turn to it. Yeah, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, God's word, that's the God's word that they had. And on his law he meditates day and night. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 9. Uh, Moses tells the people something uh, very similar. In these words that I command you today, uh, excuse me, and these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And in Deuteronomy 11, there's a few verses where it says it's almost the same thing. It's almost word for word. That's taking God's word seriously. I'm talking about them all the time. Are we talking about God's word in our homes? Are we talking about God's word when we go out uh, to the store, when we go out to work? Um, and if not, why not? I, I like to read old stories sometimes, and especially short stories. Um, but I get the impression from a lot of these old, from you know, either decades or even a century or two you know, ago, um, I get the impression from the way these authors write about, and it's usually European or American authors, that the society, the people back then knew the Word of God. They allude to it in these stories, like you're just supposed to kind of understand. People are going to church, people are at least understanding about church and that kind of thing, even if the characters aren't, you know, that kind of, um, that kind of thing. And so. I'm thinking that's not, that's so far from, from where we are today. How often do people, just the outsiders, know what's going on, know what the Bible says about something? How often are they exposed to it? Are we exposing people to it? Would we be considered, you know, uh, weird or radical or something if we do? This tells me something about our society, but, you know, who cares? I don't really care if they label me a Jesus freak, right? You remember that song? I'm mean, going to have that attitude. Joshua 1.8, uh, God says the same thing to Joshua, who's taking over command of the army. Take the book of the law, should not depart from you. Meditate on it day and night, he says. Matthew 4.4, 4, Jesus says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but shall live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's important. It needs to be important to me. I need to be dedicated to learning from it and orienting my life to the truths and the philosophy of the Bible. So I have a couple of, um, that's, that's first, that's a prerequisite. If I'm not doing that, what's the point of going to try to talk to someone else about Jesus when I don't really, I'm not, I'm not there? Um, 
So, evidence. So if I'm, if I'm there, I've got my relationship with the Lord good. I'm, I'm like, I, I feel, feel good about um, what's happening. Never perfect, of course, but, um, but I'm ready to be useful to God. I really want to be useful to Him. I have a couple of, uh, of, uh, of ways, I guess, that we can provide uh, evidence to outsiders that we can represent God well. And the first one is uh, my personal testimony. So I think about this, there was an elder at our old church in Florida that always would ask people, he asked me, and it was challenging at the time that he asked me, uh, it's not now, but, um, and I've heard, him ask, I've heard him ask several other people, what was your life like before you started following Christ? And now how has it changed? So I think, I think specifically about my life, he would say before you became a Christian, before you started following Christ, whatever. Um, if I don't have an answer to that, then I need to think about, I need to evaluate myself. What is my life like? Why, do I, why, do, why can I not answer that question very well? It's difficult for some people. Um, but anyway, I can tell somebody that. Like, so personal testimony, if I'm gonna be useful to God and uh, representing Him to outsiders, I can just straight up tell somebody my testimony. Can I tell you what my life was like before Christ? And then after. As you can tell from me, probably from my reaction to just even thinking about that, it's night and day for me as far as the things that I'm going after, the things that are important to me, did a complete 180 switch. And it wasn't, there was one time that I can think of that I really made a decision in my life, I'm going to do what's right from now on. No matter what, because I was at a time where this is not in my notes, but I was at a time where I was just following my own heart all the time, my selfishness. And I did things that should have destroyed, or did destroy some relationships and should have um, been a lot worse than it was. But by the grace of God, He saved me from the, from the results, what should have been the results of my own actions and my own selfishness. And since I decided to follow him, like for real, like I said, I grew up in church, but since I made that decision, I'm gonna do what's right from now on, I'm gonna follow him like for real and not for fake anymore. Um, then my whole attitude about life has slowly changed and I've been uh, so much more happier, so much more joyful. Peace about things that used to stress me out. I'm not focused on myself and my own desires anymore and it's a freedom. It's a freedom that people are looking for some sort of peace in like a crazy, chaotic world. Um, so we can talk about that, how Jesus has uh, changed my life, how following Christ has been so much better than what I was doing before. Uh, the second way is a little more indirect, but I call it the, um, through our conduct or the results. If I'm not telling someone specifically, this is what Jesus has done for me, it should be evident in the way I'm living, okay? So my conduct, they can see my conduct, the results, especially if someone who knew, maybe knew me before I really started following Christ seriously, they might see a, a difference. That's another way we can represent uh, God and Christ uh, to outsiders. And Dave talked about this last week uh, with uh, Colossians 3. There's that list of things. This is what you were, but you need to put these things to death. Uh, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry, sexual immorality, and put on them love, compassionate hearts, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts as we deal with one another in unity. And the, the, so the, the people that know me should see that, even if I'm not necessarily talking to them about it. So that's a couple ways. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to really um, talk to you about this morning is um, I'm really passionate about this. Um, there's truth out there, and the truth is on our side. A lot of us, and myself included, have been deceived by fake philosophy or fake science, and a lot of us for some reason believe, and it's not for some reason, I know it's intentional, I believe it's intentional by the devil, 
and I'm still recovering, I just saw someone recently, I'm still recovering from my public school education, brainwashing, um, that I didn't realize for a long time that I had these kind of things, I'm going to detail a couple of them here in a second, creeped into my thinking and the way I thought about myself, the way I thought about the world, the way I thought about life, and what's important. Um, so I, I think it's important for us to not be deceived by this what I would call fake or faulty or erroneous uh, philosophy. Faith is not blind faith. We do not have to have blind faith. There is lots of evidence for everything that we believe. Okay, And whether it's personal experience or even scientific, archaeological evidence, historical evidence, there is lots of evidence. For, but if you just look at the media and if there's someone who does not has not taken the time to either, someone has not specifically taught them about this stuff or they haven't investigated it specifically for themselves or just going off what they learn in school, especially public school or the media, they're going to think that, well, religion and science are there at odds, right? Or religion and history. If you have faith, that just means, oh, it's a blind faith. You have to take a leap of faith because there's no evidence for this. You just have to believe it. There's a little bit of truth to that, but not much because there's evidence for the stuff that we believe. In fact, I was reading a book by Gregory Kokel called Tactics. It was a great book that Gary uh, Edwards, at least at his house, at our group, was, uh, uh, told me about. And it's about talking with people who are outsiders, is what the whole book is about. Um, and he, he has a list at the end of the book, he has a list of words that he doesn't use anymore. And faith is one of those words. He does not use the word faith. Because now in the 21st century, most people think that faith means that blind faith. Oh, well, it's, not, it's nothing that can be supported by evidence. You just believe it just because. And that's not what our faith is. He uses the word trust because I have come to trust God, which has a different connotation. And, he's, and, he's, and he thinks he, um, his own research and study, he thinks that's more, probably more accurate to the Greek word that they use than faith. At least the way our modern English language now uses it, faith, the definitions, you know, kind of change over time of our language. And so he uses trust. Well, I've come to trust God. That sounds more like something based on evidence, something based on something real. I've come to trust God. I've found that God is trustworthy. i found that God's word is trustworthy. So he uses trust instead of faith. That's something to think about. Um, yeah, we have strong evidence for the things we believe. So we can talk about it with confidence. If something like that comes up, if someone, if we're having to be talking to someone, they bring up an objection to our faith. Um, we can talk about our faith with confidence. That's difficult to do if you don't know some of the answers to some of these questions. So I really want to talk about one, one thing, maybe two, um, that, uh, that you might encounter. But I can be a resource for you because I've spent a lot of time searching online, reading books about apologetics, about science, history, and philosophy, and these kind of things. So if you would like to learn more, I would I love to talk about this kind of stuff. I'm not going to take a whole a lot of time right now. But the main thing that I think we need to recognize, that like I said, the media, uh, the government, uh, the medical profession also, they operate under non-biblical assumptions about life. And the main one is called reductionism. Have you heard of reductionism? It is the belief that, or the assumption that, really, everything that exists can be reduced, this one's called reductionism, can be reduced to just the sum of its parts. So where that goes logically is that, and this is pervasive in all of society except for in our in churches and probably in other religion, um, religions as well, that acknowledge the spiritual. Where it leads to is a, an eventually just rejection of anything spiritual at all. Matter that we can see and observe and touch and feel and taste and smell and hear that I get on five uh, That is all there is. So you, as a human being, are can be reduced to just the cells of your body, just the molecules and just the atoms uh, that make up your body. And so your feelings and your free will that we have and your emotions and your thoughts is nothing but just different types of atoms just doing different things in your in your body. And it's and it leads to this determinism, which is you don't actually have free will. In fact, I think I might be skipping ahead, but Luke, could you put up that picture? Because I was searching something about this on uh, YouTube. And look at the stuff that comes up. Uh, it might be too small to read. But the first one, the illusion of free will. Um, and the second one, why free will doesn't exist. 
And I think, I don't know if you can read it, but on the description of that first one, the illusion of free will, it actually talks about you are just a group of atoms that responds to stimuli. And that's all you are. And then the third one there with a semi-inappropriate picture, um, the harm principle, how to live your life the way you want to. That's the logical end of this stuff. Just rejecting anything except what I want to do. And we've already talked about, I've already talked about how that is bad. It's a really bad idea to just follow your heart. But that actually comes from that principle of reductionism that uh, most modern scientists buy into and believe. And it does make for good scientific inquiry because if you just said, well, God did this all the time, then you never come up with any more facts or truth or facts or answers about things. But it, so it's good for discovering facts, but not for discovering truth. The problem is people believe, a lot of people believe that that is how, that reductionism philosophy is how we should interpret the scientific inquiry. And those are two different things. So if you hear stuff like this in the media, I just want you to be aware that that's what's going on. It turns into materialism, where everything is only made of matter. Matter is all there is. Um, it's very dangerous. Of course, we see in the Bible uh, that Dave read last week from Colossians 3. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Um, that's the encouragement from the Bible. In Deuteronomy, I like Deuteronomy too. Deuteronomy 8, again. Uh, Be careful not to forget the Lord your God. And that's Deuteronomy 8, 11 and a lot of other verses. So he warns us in the Bible, don't forget about God. And they did over and over again. And they get into the book of Judges in the last four, read the last four chapters of the book of Judges. Everybody was just following, everybody did, what they say, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel. And this disaster and, uh, and ridiculous, um, you know, terrible stuff. That's in a civil war, you know, eventually happens with God's people. And uh, terrible things are happening when everybody's just finding. So um, that, um, yeah, your heart becomes your God. If, you're, if you forget about the Lord your God and you buy into this philosophy that we hear, and again, it's in public schools, it's in the media all the time. Follow your heart is a really bad idea, but we have it. Um, you hear that all the time, don't you? And with kids stuff, oh, just follow your heart. Do not do that. I'm telling you, do not do that. That's a really bad idea. James 1.14 um, says we are, well, let's see, I have it. I forget the word for word, so I'm James 1.14, um, he warns us against following our own heart, because I guess some people were blaming God for temptations that they had. But he says, each person is tempted, meaning tempted to do evil, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Again, following your own heart. Um, the last four chapters of Judges, I already mentioned that. Jeremiah 17.9 says it pretty clearly. Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And I have a couple other verses, but Proverbs 3.5 comes to mind. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Right? That's the biblical principles. Your heart is going to be deceitful to you. So that philosophy is erroneous. It's, it's bad. It will lead to bad things. We need to be aware of this. Um, so don't get all lovey-dovey when you watch the next Hallmark movie and it says, you know, someone's just following their heart. We need to, we need to recognize that that's not, that's not a good thing to be putting into our brain. Um, and, and our kids, we need to be teaching our kids. No, they're going to say, they're going to tell you at school or somewhere in the Mickey Mouse or something is going to tell you, follow your heart. Don't do that. We, we don't do that. We don't follow our heart. We follow the Lord. He is the Lord of our heart. He tells our hearts what to do. He is like the... Uh, God's word is like the North Star that I orient my life around. And everything else I may not know what in the heck I'm doing. Um, and, uh, but I have that one thing that I look to all the time. And I know that that is real. Everything else I might be making up as I go along. When I go to work or uh, parenting my kids or whatever. I'm just I'm making this up like Indiana Jones said in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh -huh, I'm making this up as I go. You know? But I have that one orienting principle is God. is remembering the Lord. Um, Okay, and so because of that uh, reductionist philosophy in science and in media, whatever, it, it comes out uh, really apparently, I think, in psychology. So 
this is impo this is important. I think is why I'm uh, getting it before I close here. Just because, and there's people that do that do uh, brain scans and and uh, study brain waves, and I'm not saying that stuff's fake. Okay, it's real. But just because we can identify what the brain looks like in a certain psychological disorder, or they identify, okay, speech comes from over here, and the stress or relaxation comes from your hypothalamus. I've been reading about that, so I know that one. I think it's back here, but I don't know. But I don't know what's the hypothalamus. You know, and they can identify where, well, this part of your brain's firing when you're thinking this, or when you're afraid, or when you're whatever. Just because they can identify th those things does not prove that the brain function is the cause of those things. Okay, when you think about it logically, it can be a symptom of a spiritual cause. In fact, this has almost been proven. Well, first, um, I think about, you remember Mark 5 and the man who's demon-possessed, and his name is Legion. Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, for we are many. Okay, if a modern-day psychiatrist or psychologist reads that story or met that person, what would they say? The multiple personality disorder, the dissociative identity disorder, whatever the official name of it is. Um, so that does not mean that the brain function is the cause of it. It can have a spiritual cause. Uh, because the Bible says that he had demons inside of him. Maybe the demons present themselves and it looks, if you were going to look at that person's brain, maybe it would look the same as someone who has multiple personality disorders. Maybe, I'm not saying this for sure, maybe multiple personality disorders are different demons living, different spirits living inside a person and they come out um, at different times in that way. And if I was going to do a brain scan, it would look like this. That doesn't mean that this is the cause of it. It could be a manifestation of a spiritual reality. So I just think it's important that we don't get hung up on that and believing the wrong thing about the cause and, re cause and effect. Um, there's a brain, uh, there's an experimentation done and it's been repeated. It was done in the 80s, it's done repeated in the 2000s, the same results. Um, that showed that these study participants had a physical reaction to something, to a stimuli, like something uh, poked them and they would say, ow, or I felt that. They had that reaction to it almost a half a second before the brain waves fired. So there's evidence out there that the brain is not the cause, the brain is an effect. But this lies that we hear and that a lot of our kids believe. We can know a lot of facts from science, but not the truth. Um, that the man who did that, the first study, his name Benjamin Labette, by the way, if you want to look that up. Um, consciousness, so along the same time, consciousness with psychology. Don't be fooled by anyone that says that scientists, science knows everything there is to know. You know nothing. Uh, there's a, uh, let's see, I, I heard a couple of interviews recently, one with Brian Cox, who's a professor of quantum physics at uh, University of Manchester, so he's a British accent, so he sounds really, uh, you know, legit. Um, and um, he says, in all of the quantum physics that we, that I would really like to go into, I'm not going to, all the quantum physics and quantum mechanics that we you know, and we study the brain, and the, that's talking about the tiny little particles, that's what they're studying, none of this rules out God. None of it. There's still room for you know, belief in God here, because we don't actually, it's, that's, that's philosophy, that's not science. There's nothing in the science that rules out God, but you could read some scientists like I have and says, we don't need God anymore. I think that was Stephen Hawking that famously famous kind of said that. We don't need God anymore. He's dead wrong about that. It's looking at it, everything from a reductionist point of view, which doesn't make sense. Um, and then Richard Dawkins is a very uh, famous and outspoken atheist, an evolutionary biologist, and I heard him saying in an interview, that we don't know, we basically don't know jack squat about consciousness. We don't know how it, how it came about. We don't understand it. So don't let anyone fool you into thinking that science without God is able to explain everything and understand it's not. Um, in fact, a lot, of, a lot of scientists and researchers now are going into a mindset and the mind-body link, and this it's still under the realm of psychology. But realizing that just physical things are not, it's not all we are. That there is importance, we see, they call enhanced results of medical treatments due to positive mindsets and belief. It sounds like what Jesus said in Matthew 9, your faith has made you well. Science is way behind. Science is not ahead of this. Science is way behind, still trying to catch up to this. 
But we don't know this stuff. I mean, I'm speaking in general. We don't know this stuff. Because I'm spending time on my phone. I need to put the phone away. And I need to pull this out. I need to not be binging Netflix, Stranger Things, or I don't know, is that an old one? Whatever, whatever the heck people watch on Netflix now. Why? I need to be getting this. Like, if I took this seriously, I need to act like this is actually important to me. You understand me? I need to act like this is important. Because I'm going to go way off on the wrong track if I'm not in this all the time. I'm talking about every day. Like, what's more important than this? I want to get up in the morning, I want to read it. I want to think about it. I want to go lie in my bed or sit outside where there's uh, nature or something and meditate on the truths that I learned from this. But it's no wonder our society is going to crap. Well, we don't read this. We don't talk about it. As we, we don't talk about it in our homes, talk about it when we go out on the street, talk about it when we go to work. We're too, too busy watching grown men play a game on a field. You know, I'm talking to myself there. Or, you know, watching whatever it is on YouTube or Netflix. It just entertains us. It's not benign. Okay, it's not harmless. Wasting time on other stuff. It's dangerous. Do not forget. Be careful lest you forget the Lord your God, he says in Deuteronomy 8. You're going to go after other gods. I'm passionate about this, as you might be able to tell. Get in this. If you're not... And I'm sorry if I'm not speaking to you about this this morning, if you're one that does it. But we need, to think, we need to think that this is actually important. We don't act like it in general. The um, praise team, y'all can start making your way up here because I'm almost done. So, I got a little bit off from representing God well to outsiders because I think it's important. I think it's super important if we're not... Uh, if we're not there, having that relationship, we need to get that first. And then we can pray to God to open the door for us to speak toward out, to outsiders and trust him that he will glorify himself through me. If that's not my top priority, though, I'm going to have fear and anxiety about talking to somebody else. If I really, and I'm really preaching to myself here, if I'm really my only and top priority in my life is to glorify God, for him to be glorified through me, then I don't care if, you know, if I come across as weird, if I get rejected. Whatever God wants is what goes. And that's hard to get in and stay in that mindset. I know that. Um, but that's where we need to be. We pray for God to open the door toward outsiders. Uh, there's a new, there's a brand new song we're going to sing here as we close. And it's called Somebody Needs to Hear. And uh, it's just uh, supposed to encourage us to talk to people because there's people out there somebody needs to hear what Jesus has done for me don't you think somebody that you're going to encounter this week needs to hear your testimony needs to hear some truth needs to hear something that contradicts you know this reductionist you know thing that I went on in too much length about today but uh, some real truth and some real experiences somebody needs to hear it. so will you tell somebody and the second verse of the song, sometimes I need to hear. Sometimes I need to hear the gospel. Sometimes I need to hear the good news of our Lord because I need to be reminded of it. And so the song is kind of a simple song. I hope by the end of it you'll be able to sing along with us. Um, sometimes I need to hear. So I'm going to read about it. I'm going to pray about it. What Jesus has done for me because sometimes I need to hear. Come on up, guys. We're gonna...